Many years ago, when Elaine and I were first married, we had very little furniture and uh, no TV at all. We lived in Ford Deposit. Our weekly grocery budget was seven dollars and a half. Monthly grocery bill uh, budget was thirty-five dollars, and uh, we didn't have any extra money, obviously. And uh, a neighbor gave us a television, or at least loaned us a television. Didn't work, but they said it just needed some tubes. In it. They had tubes in those days and the electrical supplies like that. And, and uh, we, we just felt like we really needed one. We carried it to Sears Roebuck to have it repaired. It was a Sylvania, I think, one of theirs. Anyway, they said, well, it would cost $27.50 to fix it. And we thought about it, and I, I said, well, we would we'll just sacrifice for that. It wasn't our TV, but we were going to get it fixed and use it a while. And when I went to pick it up, they said it was $74 and something. Man, we couldn't pay for that. I knew I couldn't pay for it. And automatically, there was a setup where I had to call for some kind of compromise. I told them I'd be glad to pay the $27.50 and they could sell the TV uh, to somebody for the uh, rest of it. Uh, and I would arrange with the people that I had borrowed the TV from uh, to settle with them. But I could not pay the $74. And uh, so it was necessary to compromise. And after much discussion with the management of Sears Roebuck here in Montgomery, they finally agreed to let me pay what they told me it would cost to start with and let us take the TV home because they didn't want it. <laughs> and that it wasn't worth the $27.50, but, but we took it home. I tell all that just to say there, there are times when compromise is necessary. But you never need or should compromise with God or with one who has the strength, the right, and really owns you. We have a story in the Old Testament, the book of, of Exodus, chapter 5, beginning, where Moses is dealing with King Pharaoh or with the Pharaoh of Egypt. You remember just a few weeks ago, we talked about the reluctant prophet Moses who was told by God to go and lead the children of Israel out of bondage, and he made excuses. Uh, uh, who, me? And God said, yes, you. Who am I? I'll be with you. Uh, uh, what, what am I going to do to get the people to believe me? They won't believe me. Uh, they're going to want to know who sent you, and, and you just tell them I am sent you. And uh, the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah, but they won't believe me. Well, tell, well, put your hand in your bosom, throw your stick down, you know, all of that. God proved to him that he would make them hear him. So the message must be sent. God said, you go, you talk, and you leave the result to me. Finally, Moses goes. God sends Aaron with him. And they meet at Mount Horeb, the mountain of the Lord. I don't know how long it had been since Aaron had seen Moses, but Aaron obviously was still in Egypt. Moses had been in the wilderness. And when they met each other, they kissed at the mountain of God. Moses said to Aaron, all the words of the Lord with which, we had, with, with, with which he had sent him and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all, the, all of the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people, so the people believed. This is the last part of chapter 4 of the book of Exodus. The people believed, and when they heard that, uh, heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel, and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshiped. I want to make just a few comments here before we get to the compromises 
that Pharaoh offered to God, none of which, course, of course, God accepted. We're told here that when Aaron and Moses came to the people, the elders of Israel, that the people believed and they, when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them. There are various levels of belief, of course, and uh, trust and confidence, but when they heard the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and had seen their afflictions, they bowed and worshipped. Now God had told Moses, you go tell Pharaoh to let my children go three days' journey into the wilderness to worship. I'd like to point out here that there are various levels of worship. When they believed God, they were said to have bowed low and worshipped. Now God wants us to worship him. And worship is to bow down, to pay homage, to recognize our dependency. And our daily lives as Christians are said to be worship. Your daily living for God is worship. But I want to point out that that is worship. Nevertheless, God requires special worship on occasions, special worship in certain places. And uh, if that's not indicated here, I don't know what is. Because if they could just worship acceptably in the land, and that would be all of the worship commanded, then why go into the wilderness three days' journey and sacrifice to God? Chapter 5 begins, Afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. Notice emphasis on the word celebrate. <clears throat> Celebration here is tantamount to or equal to Worship. Worship is, of course, a very serious, somber thing, but it's a celebration of good, of the wonderful relationship that we have with God, so it ought to be a happy thing. And I know that celebration here is a worship because he says, Pharaoh said to him, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, and besides, I'll not let Israel go. <clears throat> now, I don't know what your picture of Pharaoh is in your mind, but I see him as an arrogant uh, individual who says, I know everything. He's got his thumbs in his lapel. I know everything, and I don't know God. Therefore, there isn't a God, because if there were a God, I'd know it. We know that God introduced himself <laughs> to Pharaoh in ten terrible plagues, and we'll look at these in a minute. They said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us, this is Moses and Aaron talking, please let us go three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. So not only is worship a, sacri uh, uh, a celebration, but it's a sacrifice is involved to the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence <clears throat> or with a sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labor. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and the foreman, saying, uh, you're no longer to give the people straw to make their brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And then you have make them turn out the same amount of work. Well, when this happened, children of Israel's labors were increased. Notice they we had already read where they believed Moses, caused them to worship God, give thanks to God, and suddenly there's a change. Because when their burdens are greater, they murmur against Moses. Here's what they said. <clears throat> uh, Oh, Pharaoh said, you're lazy, very lazy, therefore you say, let's go and sacrifice to the Lord. So now go and work, and you should be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. 
And the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron, and they were waiting for him. They said to them, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious to Pharaoh. Walker County language there is, you made us stink before Pharaoh and in the sight of his servants to put a sword uh, in their hands to kill us. So what did Moses do? Last two, three verses there say that Moses then returned to the Lord and he murmurs to the Lord. Here's what he says. Oh Lord, why hast thou brought the harm on this people? Why didst thou ever send me? And he goes on to say, you haven't done what you said. Now this put a bold speech to the God of the universe, but he said, you promised to deliver, deliver them and you didn't do it. Then the Lord said to Moses, beginning of chapter 6, Now you shall see what I'll do to Pharaoh. Under compulsion he shall let them go, and under compulsion he shall drive them out of the land. So God is dealing with Moses in order for Moses to deal with Pharaoh. When the, Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh and say, The Lord sent us to let his people go three days' journey into the wilderness to worship him. Aaron is 83 years old. Moses is 80 years old. And uh, they've been given a task that is daunting to lead all of these people. And while it's pretty easy to side with Moses and Aaron because of the circumstances they're in, you look at the other side, when God says, I'm with you, I'll stand with you, I'll tell you what to say, everything's in my hands, I'm in charge, you're grateful that Moses and Aaron uh, finally did what God said. When they were told that Pharaoh would be difficult to deal with, God said, I'm going to harden his heart that I might get glory for myself. The plagues started. First, they did the, the miracles that God did for Moses to convince the children of Israel that he was sent. Put the hand in the bosom, the stick on the ground, came a snake, water turned to blood. But the magicians of Egypt duplicated the sign of the stick turning to a snake with one exception. Moses' snake swallowed up their snakes <laughs> and the blood water turned to blood they could not get rid of the blood they also turned frog got the frogs but they couldn't get rid of the frogs it just seems that god gave special power to the enemy in order to make pharaoh harden his heart even more than he already had so we start the plagues there are 10 plagues the first was when the water of the Niles turned to blood. You see, I'm told it's Egyptians worshiped the Niles, so God attacked their God, didn't he? And then he sent the frogs, frogs in their ovens, frogs everywhere in their beds, frogs all over the land. I'm also told that they worshiped Heket, I think that's the proper name, uh, who's a primordial uh, goddess symbolized by a frog. So God's attacking their deities. And he is obviously superlative to their deities. And then <clears throat> after the frogs, God sent uh, uh, the gnats or lice. And this was the first plague that the magicians couldn't duplicate. They, they tried, but they could not. And uh, the magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So the magicians are converted, but not Pharaoh. And uh, then verse 21 of chapter 8, flies are sent, swarms of flies all over everywhere, except in Goshen, where the children of Israel live. So here is, here's flies in everything, except in Goshen. No flies at all in Goshen. 
I don't know about you, but I can't stand flies. And gnats or lice, these are things that give misery. And it's constant misery. And so Pharaoh makes a move to compromise. <clears throat> I think there, it's obvious that there are four attempts on Pharaoh's part to compromise with God. A compromise is to agree with, get something done, and God has given his commandment, go three days journey into the wilderness and worship me. Pharaoh is now ready to talk, but he's not ready to surrender to the will of God. So he says in verse 25, Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, go sacrifice to your God within the land. Don't go out of Egypt. Don't go to the wilderness. Go sacrifice to your God, but in the land. This is a, this is a common compromise offered to us today by Satan. The principle is the same. Satan is saying to people, Christianity is a good thing. The world's a better place because of Christianity. Try to be a good person. Sacrifice to God in the land. Acknowledge God, but don't go out of my territory. Satan's kingdom here in the earth is a kingdom of darkness. And those of us who are Christians have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, according to the Colossian letter. So <clears throat> if Satan can get us to stay in his land, stay in his kingdom and we say well i believe in jesus that's a good thing but to be born again to be added to the family to become a christian that's too much let's just sacrifice to god in the land obviously that didn't satisfy god god does not compromise he's in a position of power and so the uh, plagues followed. There's a the disease of the cattle, and there's uh, there are boils on all the people, and it, and at this time even it says that even the magicians had the boils all over them, and um, there was a distinction, a clear distinction between everything that was happening to the Egyptians and what was happening to the children of God in in Gothen. This was made clear, and finally. The people are saying to Pharaoh, do something, do something. These folks are going to destroy us. And then down uh, in, also in chapter 9 is the, the plague of the hailstorm. Now, I, I think it's interesting that we're given a weather report here um, where verse 15 says, for by now, I had, uh, God is saying to Pharaoh, by now if I had put forth my hand and struck your people with pestilence, you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this cause I've allowed you to remain in order to show my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still you, ex you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Behold, about this time tomorrow, I'll send very heavy hail such as has not been seen in Egypt from the day that it was founded until now. So there's a weather report. <laughs> and it's interesting that if God says, if you'll respond to the weather report, your cattle and your servants don't get killed. He said, everybody goes in, puts the cattle up, their cattle are not going to die. But if you leave them outside, they're all going to die, every one of them. And you would think that uh, at this point, the Egyptians would put the cattle up and take their servants in. Uh, you see, if they had faith in the weather report that God gave, they would do that. But some paid no regard to the Lord, and they left their service and the livestock in the field, and all of them died. The thunder and hell, and the fire running with fireballs running on the ground, really got Pharaoh's attention. In verse 27 of chapter 9, it says, Pharaoh sent for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I've sinned this time. The Lord is the righteous one. Make supplication to the Lord, for there's been enough 
of God's thunder and hell, and I'll let you go, and you shall stay uh, no longer. Moses said to them, as soon as I go out from the city, I'll spread my hands and the Lord uh, to the Lord, and the thunder will cease, and there will be no hell, there will be hell no longer, that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. When Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hell and the thunder had ceased, he sinned again and hardened his heart and the hearts of his servants. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he did not let the sons of Israel go, just as the Lord had spoken through Moses. God knew what he was going to do to begin with. Chapter 8, he sends the locusts, and the, the locusts are in their houses all over everywhere. They're eating the crops. Everything that was not destroyed by the hailstorm is destroyed by uh, the locusts. And this is the point where Pharaoh really gets pressure from the people. They say to Pharaoh, don't you realize that Egypt is destroyed? Moses said, we'll go with, your, with uh, our young and our old and with our sons and our daughters and with our flocks and our herds. We will go for we must hold the feast to the Lord, uh, to our Lord. The pressure then of the people is on Pharaoh and Pharaoh then offers a third compromise. Compromise number one was go worship the Lord in the land. Second compromise was go, but don't go very far. Satan does that to us too. They say, okay, if you really believe Jesus is the Son of God and you believe the Great Commission that go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, he that believes and is baptized shall be saved, he that believes not shall be damned, and, and you just insists that one must be in Christ and all that. Go ahead and be baptized into him. Go ahead and become a New Testament Christian. But once you're baptized, stay close to the edge of the water. Don't go very far into this new relationship. And so we sit on the back seat or we attend uh, just periodically or you no, know, don't get too much involved in the fellowship because if you get too close, you get involved. Just don't go very far. And then this third compromise is go, go into the land only the men go. What's Pharaoh know? He knows that the men are going to come back to the women, doesn't he? He knows they're going to come back to their family. So you can leave Egypt, but leave your family. When we commit to the Lord, we need to take our families with us. We need the support of all of us, but we simply cannot afford to offer a compromise. God does not accept such. So, I told can't do that. Plague number nine is the plague, plague of darkness. Now, it's a plague that is severe. God calls it a thick darkness. And for three days there was darkness. There was no light at all in Egypt. We're told that the children of Israel had light in their houses. And so it's, it's perfectly clear that there's a distinction between God's people and the blessings that God is putting on his people versus the people who live under Pharaoh. And Pharaoh is typical of darkness, of evil in our world. The point here is that we have a choice. Pharaoh had a choice, but the choice was to surrender, not to keep offering compromises. Pharaoh then met with Moses and Aaron, and he was, he was now admitting that he's a sinner. He said, I've sinned this time. Get rid of this. Moses prays to God, and that ceases, but he tells him, this is the last time you're gonna, I'm going to come. Pharaoh said, you're not going see, to see my face again. I'm not going to let you come. And Moses said, you're right. This is the last time. And then he tells him, about the plague of death, the death angel, we call it. 
God says there's going to be a dead one in every house in Egypt, a firstborn. Even those that are in prison, you're going to be a firstborn dead in all your flocks. Death. We can hardly imagine a thing like that. And the crying and the wailing, and you can understand why the people said, get out, leave. God has said, no compromise at all. Moses says, we're going to take the whole family, and the fourth I offer for compromise was leave your flocks. Pharaoh knew if they left their flocks, even though they took the wives and children, they'd come back because that was their means of support. And so when we commit to the Lord and refuse Satan's compromises, we go all in for God like Israel did. In order to leave, they were all in. And then we're told that they're ready to send them out and just like God said, they didn't just let them go. They forced them to leave. These four compromises or offers for compromise should be recognized as unacceptable to God. He did not take the compromise. Worship in the land. Worship uh, without going all the way. Just the men, leave your animals. God won't accept any of that. When I think of this, this passage, and I, I think of invitations to compromise, we're not tempted to compromise as much if we understand our position. This is where humility comes in. I belong to God, first of all, but I am totally dependent on God. Egypt was totally dependent on God. Pharaoh was totally dependent upon God. But his, his arrogance caused him to refuse to admit it. If I will not admit that I have no skills, abilities, powers, anything without God, then I won't attempt to compromise with God. But I'll just seek to know his will, to do it, and to trust that his leadership gets me where I need to go. Let's pray. God, help us to be convicted in your power and your strength, help us to know that we can't compromise with you, but help us to know that the way to joy and peace and power is through submission. And help us to live in that strength today and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.